This is the Y Power Mars 2000. It has two great features that I really like and one that I think that can be improved to take this power station to the next level. Be sure to watch the entire video to find out all of the details. This video is a complete test and review where we will look at all of the features and find out how this power station performs under extreme loads. I will dial up the pressure to 11 and push this device until it fails because I want to know what it can actually do when pushed to the limit. In this first test, I'm going to do a battery efficiency conversion test where I run this My Heat heater that pulls around 200 watts for the entire life of the battery. I chose this device because with the My Heat heater drawing from the power station, the fans in the power station don't run that much. So I can see how much power I actually get into the heater itself. When I run a higher power device, the fans will run, drawing more power from the power station. Once the battery is completely charged, I'll begin the test. But first, make sure to top off the charge on the like button by giving this video a thumbs up. The Live Power Mars 2000 managed to deliver 1,230 watt hours of power and it ran for about six and a half hours. That's a conversion rate of about 84%. That's a pretty standard conversion rate. Usually power stations in this size give me between 80 and 90% of conversion. So that's right in the middle of what I would expect for this power station. Now, I wanna find out if this power station is worth the cost. The Mars 2000 retails for $1,500, but it consistently has a $400 coupon lowering the price price to around $1,100. Check the link in the video description for the current price and to find out if there are any updates. So this thing is a little heavy. I'm a pretty regular size guy and at 35 and a half pounds, it's not super light, but it's not something I want to be carrying up and down stairs or for a long distance to a campsite if I don't have to. As you can see, this power station is not light. It tips the scales at 35 and a half pounds and this thing is about the size of an old milk crate coming in at 12 inches tall, 13 inches wide, and nine inches deep. In the box, you get a trifecta of charging capabilities. It comes with an AC wall charging cable, a DC car charging cable, and an MC4 solar panel adapter. So you won't need to buy any additional cables to charge this device. The Live Power Mars 2000 has a 1000 460 watt hour lithium iron phosphate battery or LFP battery rated at up to 3,500 discharge cycles with 80% full battery capacity remaining. Very few manufacturers still use NMC chemistry, but it is still out there and LFP is the gold standard in battery chemistry. This Mars 2000 checks the box. This power station houses a lot of power and this device could come in handy for emergency use during a power outage. The Mars 2000 only has ports on the front, which is a design touch that I appreciate. Managing cables in tight spaces can be difficult when there are multiple sides with attachment points. It also has two fans on each side, which is excellent for heat management, but they can be a little loud while recharging. The back is plain and smooth, which allows you to store this out of the way, and the case is aluminum with rigid plastic on the top and the bottom. There are two carrying handles that feel very strong and they are completely functional for this device. The screws on the top were super inviting so I did open the device to take a peek inside. The biggest takeaway from looking inside is that this device has substantial heat management capability with the four fans. There are two jacks on the input panel. You have one 5mm barrel plug and one Anderson power pole input. The barrel plug is for the wall charger and accepts up to 200 watts. And the Anderson power pole port is for DC charging and is rated up to 30 volts. Solar charging with this power station also goes into the five millimeter barrel plug and is a little more capable than AC charging accepting up to 240 watts. Now we're gonna test the recharging capacity using the AC power brick and this DC cable. I'm gonna start with the AC power brick, which puts in about 200 watts. When I first plug it in, the system usually jumps up to about 204 watts, and then it'll go back down and then back up. The other thing I wanna point out is that when the fan kicks on, the actual input power does drop to about 180. So I think the fans combined actually pull about 20 watts from the recharge capability. So let's try recharging with the DC cable. So as you can see with a 12 volt DC cable, I'm putting in about 
50 to 100 watts. It is fluctuating a little bit, but I think it stabilizes at around 100 watts. I've got one more. So I'm gonna take this 12 volt DC outlet, and I'm actually gonna use this 24 volt DC outlet. This will double the voltage going in, and it should give me around 200 watts going into the live power. This would be perfect if you have a car with a diesel motor, or this could also simulate that high voltage solar panel that you might use out in the wild to recharge the device. There is a dedicated button to turn on the display, as well as buttons to turn on the individual panels. This display is readable and gives the most important information needed at a glance. It shows both battery percentage remaining and a five bar battery life gauge. It also shows input power and output load. The input power gauge has three digits and the load gauge has four digits. There are some warning lights that will illuminate if errors occur during operation. So we might get to see a few of those during testing. On paper, the pure sine wave AC inverter is impressive and it should be able to handle almost anything that you would find in a home kitchen, such as microwaves and coffee makers. It is rated to put out up to 2000 watts continuously and can handle surges up to 4000 watts. There are three 110 volt AC outlets on the front and between my air compressor and my heat ray, I will test this inverter to its limits. So I have my heat ray that pulls up to about 1800 watts. And then I also have this heater that can pull about 1200 watts as well. So combined, they can pull a max of around 3,000 watts. So that'll allow me to test the inverter to see if I can get the continuous 2,000 watts and also to see how long I can run this thing above 2,000 watts. So I just turned on the heater. It immediately jumped up to about 1,250 watts. So this heater is going pretty steady at 1,287 watts. I think that's about the amount of power that this will pull in the long term. Now let's try the heat ray. So the heat ray is on its lowest setting. I'm going to slowly dial it up a little more and I'm going to go all the way and see what happens. So now we're at 2,300 watts plus or minus. It ran for about 30 seconds at 2,300 watts. So this thing will not run much more than its design power rating for a very long time. I don't consider that a fail because it at least ran as designed. Moving over to the USB panel, there is one 60 watt USB-C power delivery port, as well as one 18 watt USB-A outlet and two 12 watt USB-A jacks. Now I'm gonna test the USB-C on my MacBook and see if I can pull the 60 watts out of the USB-C outlet with my MacBook. My MacBook was at about 60% when I started this test and I hit right up to the 60 watt limit and I've been pulling 60 watts for about three minutes now. So the USB-C does put out around 60 watts. The 12 volt DC panel is a little less powerful than I'm used to. It is rated at up to eight amps or 96 watts. But for me, this is plenty of power to run a mini fridge and combined with its huge battery, this thing will run my mini fridge for a few days without recharging. There are two 5521 barrel plug outlets, but I'm not so sure if anyone actually uses these ports in modern times. This power station has four fans and this is an excellent feature for heat management, but depending on your use scenario, these fans might be excessively loud. The fans turn on within a few minutes of beginning recharging and run until the charge is fully completed. Additionally, I believe the continuous running of the fans consumes some of the power going back into the system, adding more time to charge the system. For me, the system took about eight hours to recharge from 0%. So this is the feature that I would like to see improved in future generations of this power station. Given such a large battery, I believe that a 400 to 800 watt recharge rate would make this device a better solution for small off-grid applications. Speaking of charging, this device accepts up to 200 watts from any of the supplied wall charger, car charger, or MC4 cable. Although with the MC4 cable, you can pump in up to 240 watts. Additionally, the Mars 2000 accepts up to 30 volts, so check your solar panel setup to make sure that you have the correct voltage configuration. The Lie Power has quite a few protection features built in, but I think that any lithium iron phosphate battery should have a low temperature cutoff switch. These batteries can go bad and become all but useless if charged below freezing temperatures. So keep this in mind if you plan to use this in an off-grid application with extreme low temperatures. Overall, this power station 
Station is an excellent option for someone looking for a lot of features at a low budget price. This device can handle almost any load from AC devices, making it very flexible for cooking devices such as hot plates, microwaves, and coffee makers. And there are a few very similar devices with varying features, but LiPower does offer up to four years of warranty. Although you should expect to get around 10 years of use out of the LFP battery, so hopefully you won't need it. Let me know if you have any questions or if you want me to test something specific in the comments. Now click here to watch my latest video.